Okay, in our video series on cardiology board camp, in this video, we are going to talk about supraventricular tachycardia. We'll discuss the causes, the clinical presentation, and the management of supraventricular tachycardia step by step. First of all, what is supraventricular tachycardia? Supraventricular means above the ventricles. Above the ventricle means the origin is from the atria. Supraventricular tachycardia. Tachycardia means rate greater than 100 beats per minute. So there is tachycardia and origin of that tachycardia is above the ventricles in the atria. So tachycardia that is generated in the sinus node or tachycardia that is generated in the AV node or atrial myocardium that is called as a supraventricular tachycardia. Supraventricular tachycardia has many causes, many different types. It includes sinus atrial tachycardia, multifocal atrial tachycardia, AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia, which is the most common form and two-third cases of supraventricular tachycardia are due to AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. Other than that, Atrioventricular re-entry tachycardia is also a cause. Junctional tachycardia is also a cause of supraventricular tachycardia. So these are different types of supraventricular tachycardia and they have different ECG presentation and different clinical presentation. But in this video, we are going to focus on the most common cause, the AV nodal re-entry tachycardia, which makes up for the two-third of the cases of supraventricular tachycardia. This is a picture showing different types of supraventricular tachycardia. In this picture, you can see AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. It normally, current flows from atria from SA node to AV node and from AV node current goes into the ventricles, which results in the contraction of ventricles. What happens in AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia is that current flows from atria to ventricles. Then that current again goes back to the atria. Normally, current does not flow back from ventricles to atria. It flows from the atria to ventricles. But in re-entrant tachycardia, the current is re-entering from the ventricles to atria again. So the current flows from atria to ventricles and from ventricles current again goes back into the atria. So current is forming a loop. Current is going from atria to ventricles and from ventricles to atria again and again. And that causes stimulation of atria and ventricles resulting in rapid heart rate. And the origin, the problem is in the atria. So there is actually an accessory path from which the current is again leaking from the ventricles to atria. So that is called as AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. Other than that, atrial fibrillation is also a supraventricular tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, AV re-entrant, atrioventricular re-entry tachycardia, atrial flutter. These are different types of supraventricular tachycardia, but we are going to mainly focus on the AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia, which is the most common form of supraventricular tachycardia. I have talked about management of atrial fibrillation in detail in my video on atrial fibrillation management. You can check out the link in the description below. Now, what is the presentation of a patient with supraventricular tachycardia? A patient with supraventricular tachycardia would come to you with palpitations because the patient is having tachycardia, rapid heart rate. The patient would feel that the heart is running at a fast pace. The patient would experience chest pain. The patient would be dyspneic, and the patient would be experiencing dizziness, presyncope. Dizziness, presyncope is a very common. Uh, clinical feature of supraventricular tachycardia. Other than that, patient might also feel that their neck is pounding, their shirt is flapping, their shirt is flapping because the heart is beating at such a fast rate that the carotids are pushing blood again and again to the brain, resulting in the flapping of the shirt, the neck is pounding and patient might also complain of urinary urgency, polyuria. So these are all the clinical symptoms in which palpitations pre-syncope, dizziness, feeling of neck pounding, these are the common ones. An important point to remember that when a patient comes to you, patient is sweating, patient is having chest pain, patient is having palpitations, supraventricular tachycardia is most commonly misdiagnosed as an anxiety or panic disorder. So whenever you are going to make a diagnosis of panic disorder or anxiety, you must always rule out supraventricular tachycardia before making any psychiatric diagnosis. Now the patient has come to you with palpitations, 
chest pain, dizziness, pre-syncope, and you put the stent on the heart, there is tachycardia, and you listen a heartbeat like this. This is the examination finding. This is the auscultation finding that you would find in a patient with supraventricular tachycardia where the heart is running at a very fast pace. Now, after auscultating the patient, after examining the patient, the next step would be that you would go for ECG. And when you perform the ECG, the heart rate would be around 150 to 20 beats per minute. Heart is running at a fast pace. And when you look at the ECG, you would see a narrow QRS complex. How would you know that it is a narrow QRS complex? This is a QRS wave and in the QRS from Q to R, normally you would find three small boxes in the QRS. On the ECG, you would find three small boxes in the QRS. But if it is less than three boxes, that is a narrow QRS complex. And remember, in supraventricular tachycardia, you would find the, the small boxes to be less than three. This is an ECG of a patient with supraventricular tachycardia. I'll zoom it at the QRS so that you can see that how many small boxes are there. There is just one small box present. There is just one small box in the QRS. It means that the QRS is narrow. That's the second important finding. First, the rate will be very rapid. Second, the QRS will be small. There will be less than three small boxes in the QRS, narrow QRS. Third most important finding that you would see in supraventricular tachycardia is that you won't be able to appreciate presence of P waves. The P waves will be buried in the QRS complexes. There will be just T wave. This is the T wave that is present. After T wave, there is usually it is followed by P wave. But there is no P waves. There are just T waves. That is because that P waves are present in the ECG, but you cannot see them because they are buried by the QRS complexes. QRS complexes are coming at such a fast pace that they are actually hiding the P waves. So, what if you want to see? the P waves. There is a small trick that you can do. What you can do is to see the buried P waves. What you can do is that you can increase the speed of ECG machine. The ECG machine that you are having, you can increase the speed of ECG from 25 millimeter per second to 50 millimeter per second. If you double up the speed of ECG, then you will be able to appreciate the P waves, the presence of P waves since the ECG is coming at a rapid uh, pace, then the P waves can become visible. So the trick is that if you want to see the P waves, you have to do a rapid ECG, ECG at 50 millimeter per second. Now coming to the treatment and management of supraventricular tachycardia, patient has come to you with palpitations, tachycardia, dizziness, pre-syncope. The first thing that you have to do is that you have to check the vitals, you check the oxygen saturation. If the saturation of oxygen is less than 90, you give oxygen because the patient will be dyspneic. You gain the IV access, you perform ECG and you see whether the adverse signs are there or not. What are the adverse signs? If the patient is in shock, if the patient has chest pain, if the patient is having ischemia on ECG, if the patient is showing heart failure signs, it means that these are the adverse signs and that patient needs a rapid management. That patient is deteriorating. If you do not manage this patient, this patient will deteriorate. If any of these signs are present, the next step would be that you get the expert help, you sedate the patient and you shock the patient. Remember, before giving the shocks, you have to sedate the patient. You sedate the patient and you give synchronized shock since this patient is unstable. To stabilize this patient, you have to correct the rhythm of the heart. You give three synchronized DC shocks. You give them at 70 to 120 joules. And then you can increase it up to 120 to 360 joules. You give these shocks after sedating the patient if the patient is unstable. And then you check and correct magnesium, potassium, 
calcium you give amiodarone 300 mg iv over 20 minutes and then again shock the patient if the patient is not getting better so this is the management protocol of the patient which is unstable you shock the patient you correct the electrolytes you see whether the patient is getting better or not you give amiodarone and if the patient is still not getting better you again shock the patient till the time the rhythm is corrected and patient is stable now if the patient does not have any of these adverse sign and ecg is showing a supraventricular tachycardia if these signs are absent in that case you have to see that whether the rhythm on the ecg is regular or not if the rhythm is regular the next thing is that you have to start continuous ecg monitoring and you perform wiggle maneuvers remember if the rhythm is regular it is most likely supraventricular tachycardia you perform the wiggle maneuvers in the wiggle maneuvers you press on the carotids and the pressing on the carotid stimulates the wiggle nerves and wiggle nerves slows down the heart and controls the tachycardia but remember before applying for carotid massage you apply carotid massage on one side and you always check carotid brewy before giving the massage we'll talk about carotid massage in detail in a while but what if the rhythm is irregular if the rhythm is irregular then the possible cause of this tachycardia can be atrial fibrillation and you have to treat it according to the atrial fibrillation so if the patient is stable then you see that whether the rhythm is regular or not if the rhythm is irregular then you treat it as an afib i have talked about treatment of afib in detail in my video on atrial fibrillation the link of that video is in the description if the rhythm is regular then it is most likely supraventricular tachycardia and you have to perform the wiggle maneuvers now what are the wiggle maneuvers that can be performed wiggle maneuvers actually stimulate the wiggle nerve and stimulation of wiggle nerve slows down the heart slows down the tachycardia and controls the heart rate so in the wiggle maneuvers you can ask the patient to perform valsalva maneuver how do you perform valsalva maneuver you give the patient an empty syringe empty syringe like this and you ask the patient to blow in this syringe what this will cause it will stimulate the wiggle nerve and slow down the heart you can also perform modified valsalva maneuver in modified valsalva maneuver what you do is that you give the patient a syringe and you ask the patient to blow into the syringe for 15 seconds in semi recumbent position patient is lying in semi recumbent position and you ask the patient to blow into the syringe and then after 15 seconds what you do is that you lay the patient down straight and elevate the legs to 45 degrees you elevate the legs to 45 degrees and then you wait for 15 seconds after that you again keep the patient in semi recumbent position and you check the rhythm of the heart so you ask the patient to blow into syringe in semi recumbent position after that you lay the patient down straight you elevate the legs and then you wait for 15 seconds after that you again put the patient in semi recumbent position in the a position and then you check the rhythm on ecg patient sits in semi recumbent position blows into 10 ml syringe for 15 seconds then the patient is laid supine with legs elevated to 45 degrees for 15 seconds you return the patient to the previous position and wait for 45 seconds you assess the rhythm on ecg diving reflex diving reflex is an also wiggle maneuver in which you immerse the patient's head into cold water which causes wiggle stimulation or you can simply apply ice bags on the forehead and the nasal area it causes wiggle stimulation slow in resulting in the slowing down of the heart and control of supraventricular tachycardia other than that carotid sinus massage is a very common technique but before doing carotid sinus massage you must look for carotid brewy because if there is any carotid brewy it means that there is atherosclerosis present in the carotid arteries and if you apply sinus massage if you apply carotid sinus massage there is a chance that that atherosclerotic plaque can get dislodged and can go into brain and can get stuck in the vessels of the brain resulting in stroke ischemic stroke so if the carotid brewy is present do not perform carotid sinus massage if the uh, brewy is absent then you can perform carotid sinus massage but you have to perform it unilaterally you cannot perform it bilaterally do not simultaneously massage both carotids now if the patient rhythm was regular we started continuous ecg monitoring we performed the wiggle maneuvers 
including the valsalva maneuver modified valsalva maneuver diving reflex carotid sinus massage but if all these maneuvers fail then you give the drugs you give adenosine adenosine is the drug of choice for supraventricular tachycardia it is the main drug for the treatment of supraventricular tachycardia how do you give adenosine adenosine is given 6 mg iv bolus into a large vein followed by 0.9% normal saline iv flush if unsuccessful after 2 minutes you again give 12 mg dose and if the patient is not getting better then you repeat the dose of 12 mg so it is 6 mg followed by 12 mg followed by 12 mg if the patient does not improve then you repeat the dose 12 mg and after 12 mg you can again third time repeat the dose to 12 mg 6 12 12 adenosine is contraindicated in asthma adenosine causes bronchoconstriction you cannot give adenosine in asthmatic patients so you should check beforehand that whether the patient is asthmatic or not side effects include dyspnea chest tightness and headache no if you cannot give adenosine if the patient is asthmatic or if despite giving the adenosine the patient supraventricular tachycardia is not controlled in that case you need to go for calcium channel blockers calcium channel blockers include verapamil 5 to 10 mg iv is given you can give it at the rate of 1 mg per minute or you can also go for diltiazem if it is not controlled by calcium channel blocker you can also use beta blockers like metoprolol which comes with the name of merol metoprolol is also used to control the rate when the calcium channel blockers and adenosine has failed and even after giving all these things the patient supraventricular tachycardia is not controlled in that case you perform synchronized cardioversion you cardioverted the patient you give shocks to the patient to correct the rhythm after giving shocks you should go for electrophysiological studies ep studies in which you see that where is that circuit where is that loop where the current is recirculating from the ventricles to the atria where the current is going again and again in a loop you detect that a uh, loop of fibers a loop of current and you would ablate those and you burn those fibers that are causing reentry of the currents from the ventricles to atria so catheter ablation of the pathways is done that is the most important treatment of supraventricular tachycardia so first of all we performed the wiggel maneuvers if wiggel maneuvers did not control it we would give adenosine after adenosine we usually give calcium channel blocker or beta blockers and even if these drugs do not control it we shock the patient and after that we perform the ep studies and we ablate and burn those accessory pathways that are causing recirculation of the currents at the end i'll briefly talk about narrow complex tachycardia a method that i use to memorize all these different types of arrhythmias if there is narrow complex tachycardia if the ecg is showing qrs complex less than three small boxes if it is narrow complex then you have to see that whether it is regular or irregular if it is regular then you see that whether p wave is present or not if the p wave is present then it is normal sinus tachycardia or it can be atrial flutter or it can be multifocal atrial tachycardia if the p wave is hidden then it is most likely av nodal reentrant tachycardia which is a supraventricular tachycardia if it is narrow complex and the rhythm is irregular the rhythm of the heart is irregular then you have to see that whether p waves are present or not if the p waves are absent it's atrial fibrillation if the p wave is present and rhythm is irregular that is called as sinus arrhythmia so this is an extra point in this video that i wanted to add so that you can memorize or classify the narrow complex tachycardias in summary we talked about supraventricular tachycardias tachycardias generated above the ventricles which include av nodal reentrant tachycardia in two third of the cases the clinical symptoms of patient with supraventricular tachycardia misdiagnosed as anxiety or panic disorder ecg will show rapid rate narrow qrs p waves buried 
if the patient has adverse sign shock the patient if the patient does not have adverse sign if the rhythm is regular start ecg monitoring perform wiggle maneuvers if a wiggle maneuvers fail give adenosine 6 mg if the 6 mg does not control you can give 12 mg if 12 mg does not control you can repeat the dose calcium channel blocker can be given if adenosine does not control it beta blockers can also be used if all these drugs fails you do synchronized cardioversion EP studies are done to detect the fibers and those fibers are burnt. If you liked my video, please click on the subscribe button and check out my other videos on cardiology bootcamp. The link of those videos is given in the description below. Thank you very much.